so uh, this talk's title is uh, disruption belongs and uh, it's from uh, uh, Johnson Guru's book uh, don't take your life personally the chapter this is one of the chapters one of the chapters So, uh, while starting uh, uh, the talk in the chapter, he, uh, Ajahn Sumidhu uh, gives his uh, personal experience that once uh, uh, while <coughs> uh, eating food, he was uh, sitting uh, closer to the monks. One of the monks was possibly uh, in depression, and other monk was possibly used to make loud noises while having the food. And uh, then Ajahn Sandhu compares it with uh, the possibly the present situation where the monk sitting closer to him are all very senior monks. Probably well trained in Dhamma. And then he says that when we are in a situation, uh, 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 the earlier situation, it can be discomforting uh, in the sense that our mind uh, doesn't like the things and uh, it doesn't, based on the situation, it likes the situation doesn't like the things and there is another example uh, he gave was like uh, while reading the newspaper most of the time these days newspapers are filled with uh, negative information so uh, if you read newspaper it's uh, most likely you cannot escape from that negativity and then he wants to point uh, with all these examples is that that's the way it is it's really not about that you should not feel those uh, uh, states or you have to control and always be in a uh, positive thing. But it's really uh, whatever uh, present state is, that's the way it is about uh, trusting um, in the uh, present moment rather than trying to uh, change, rather than uh, trying to we always in this uh, discomfort and uh, wanting to not accept the present moment. And that's where uh, the first slide uh, comes from, is that by being aware of the way it is, you cease to resent the world for not always uh, looking like Buddha Rupa or being a serene paradise where everything is pleasing because this is not the way it is. Much of the world is unpleasing. Many things we experience are upsetting or depressing or unpleasant. So uh, there is this another example which uh, Ajahn Samhita gave uh, is that uh, whenever he used to, he faces, uh, um, whenever he faces Buddha's statue, uh, because of his years of practice, he always feels this uh, calm and serene. But whenever he uh, uh, faces towards uh, people, then all the uh, sensory impingement uh, uh, comes. But this he uses that as a way of uh, reflection that that's the way uh, things are. You really don't need to struggle to correct the things, but kind of have the acceptance of the things they are. The ability to reflect brings you in the present. 
through trusting in awareness you bring you begin to recognize a state of peace that is with you all the time that is not dependent on lack of improvement or sensory deprivation you then see dhamma you get in touch with what you might call your true nature or buddha nature that which most people are not really aware of so uh, again Ajahn Sumedho makes these distinctions that in whatever state you may be, uh, uh, that, uh, whatever the, you may be going through physical pain or uh, you may be in an uncomfortable situation, but uh, if you accept it as the way it is, then uh, there can be a peace which can come uh, with that acceptance and that peace that trusting that comes uh, that is beyond uh, 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 the situations in the sense that the situations cannot kind of uh, uh, make that peace uh, come and go that peace is there and you I think you just relax into that peace and and it's it's not that your uh, uh, stress goes away or uh, if you are in a pain, your pain goes away. But with that pain or those comfortable or uncomfortable situations, there can be uh, still that peace. And uh, that's the uh, trusting of awareness, as I answer with the points towards. And uh, there is this. Uh, 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 Part of the sentence which came that that is not dependent on the lack of impediment or sensory deprivation, and that came from uh, the fact that uh, many times we feel that we need to uh, go to a meditation retreat or we need to uh, be in a quiet place so that we can have that peace. And he says that uh, that's really that peace is not really dependent upon. Uh, you having sensory deprivation. This is not something you create through tranquilizing your mind or through any other technique, but it is uh, it is a reality you tend to overlook when you are caught up in reacting too strongly to sensory impediments. Or liking or not liking the things that that you are experiencing. So uh, again, uh, if the tendency uh, is that uh, again, Ajahn Swamidhu uh, in the various talks he uh, do mention that uh, tranquilizing the mind uh, uh, or doing the meditation with uh, concentration uh, tranquilizes the mind. But uh, how much ever the refined meditation you have. Uh, it's impermanent and it will go away and when the tranquility goes away uh, many times what happens is that uh, the stronger the tranquility has been in one of the experience of meditation the stronger will be the the suffering uh, and the longing to uh, attain that tranquility again but uh, that's where the Ajahn Samhita says that that uh, that uh, Peace or uh, awareness, uh, that, that, that trusting which comes, uh, that is really not dependent upon whether you are in a tranquil state or you are in a state of uh, suffering. Coming towards the next slide. Again, uh, uh, the second slide is related with the thinking and Ajahn Zumedho. Uh, I mentioned is that uh, our thinking is uh, kind of uh, uh, linear in the sense that we can think about one thought at a time. And uh, uh, he made this comment with reference to Padicca Sankar. He says that when we read the dependent origination uh, uh, links, uh, ignorance, uh, 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 causes 
is the play uh, ignorant needs to sankhara 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 vidya pachya sankhara sankhara pachya like so when we uh, think about it we have to think about it in uh, one at a time but they are essentially the things you know, kind of which uh, uh, arise uh, simultaneously and uh, if you hold on to thinking about and analyzing the buddha's teaching you will always be caught in the assumptions which we make from logic reason and the dualistic function of the mind uh, again uh, uh, what rajan singh says is that uh, our uh, tendency to you know, try to grasp the things with logic is strong but how much ever uh, uh, we may try to uh, uh, do that will be uh, uh, that's not the way uh, to uh, understand or to reflect on the teachings of buddha don't even have to know what understanding is you don't have to think have i caught it if you think about it you probably you uh, you probably think you have it again uh, uh, that's the uh, uh, the uh, whole tendency trying to know uh, trying to uh, reason it out whether you are doing it correctly or not it itself is the one which will uh, bind you because it's it's like trying to capture uh, uh, the uh, nibbana in your thinking when you try to really understand that uh, whether you are doing it right or you are doing uh, it correct way that's again it takes you towards the dualistic uh, aspect of the mind the next slide uh, is on uh, ignorance again uh, uh, ignorance is the uh, the first uh, of the chain and uh, it's the ignorance which uh, eventually leads to uh, uh, us getting caught uh, in in suffering and as a chance to say is uh, ignorance is being caught up in my own views opinions identities the sense of myself as a permanent personality thinking that the material world is ultimate reality making assumptions having prejudices prejudices and biases and emotional habits if we attach to ignorance it affects everything else so that's where i think uh, the message of ajahn said is that if we start from ignorance if our practice starts from ignorance as he famously says that if you you if you try to practice to try to attain then again there is this craving and, and you will you still don't uh, get that essence ignorance ignorance affects the present moment if you start with ignorance if i am caught in feeling self conscious and suspicious or frightened and try to suppress then ignorance affects my thoughts emotions physical body the conditioned dream around me and of course consciousness that's where starting with it if we have started with ignorance then there is no escape the whole chain starts and uh, it takes it affects everything Your thoughts, emotions, uh, physical body, uh, uh, our uh, conditions uh, around us, and in fact, our whole uh, conditioned consciousness. And that's where the Ajahn Sumedho says that encouragement is to relax. <coughs> encouragement to relax is a suggestion which might help you move away from ignorance, uh, from just adding. ignorance to ignorance and uh, so that's where uh, i think uh, pointing by ajahn sumedho is that that in the present moment if we don't 
add. Uh, we don't we can kind of stop adding on ignorance. Uh, that's where uh, uh, the awareness, uh, the trusting in the awareness, uh, the chance of the points to. When there is ignorance of reality, the result is always going to some form of suffering. Learning to trust in awareness is a way to uh, awaken from the ignorance. You can stop here. It's going to be very interesting. Okay. Okay. So uh, we'll stop here and uh, sir will now discuss about the. Is there any comments? Any any questions before we start the discussion? There are many asked. So to uh, tell you, sir, we have uh, Amit, Bharti, uh, Deepthi, Garima, Minakshi, uh, Rajendra ji, uh, Srinivas ji, Silesh and <coughs> and share with you the briefly what uh, transpired. We had a hectic uh, ten-day pilgrimage come retreat, and two of the people who are there on the online were also with me, Srinivasji and Rajendraji. Besides that, it was Arpan and Anish Goel. So five of us went around. We went to different monasteries. The main idea was to show them the presentation on the site which we had made and to get their opinion on how we go about. So we went to Wat Marjan, which is this, towards the south of Bangkok. From there, then we flew to Ubon, then went to Wat Nanachar, then to Wat Pakong, then to Wat Pasi. These are all in the neighborhood of Ubon. And then we went to also see the uh, holy site which is there in Thailand containing the bone relics, of, uh, chest bone relic of Buddha. Then we went to Wat Ratnavan. So in all these monasteries we met the senior monks, as they are called Lumpur. Lumpur meaning affectionate father generally title given to people who are meditating for a long time, doing monks for a long time and are about 60 years of age. That's what we learned. It's, there's no fixed way of designating people call them. And uh, by talking to the monks themselves and others, uh, the general belief in the community is that at least three or four of them are arhans. So that's the status of the people who might have quite a Great joy to meet them. And, uh, all of them were very happy that this possibility has arisen, arisen that uh, monastery will come up. And they made various suggestions on how to go about it. Uh, one main suggestion was that it should be done in slow fashion. We should not go about straight away setting, setting up the whole monastery. We should first set up a few cities, invite monks. For short duration, let them stay there and go on paying the path and see and make a good rapport with the surrounding people. And then gradually over the years, <coughs> we build up rapport and then till such time as a monk volunteers, senior monk volunteers to come here as an abbot and uh, start the proper monastery. So we suggested one thing was this, which I think almost everybody is suggesting. We should build maybe a few, few kutis in a very simple one, absolutely basic minimum facilities and a small hall where people can meet and meditate. Yeah, they can do Buddha statue. In fact, uh, what Panana Shat, uh, about Rajan Kevli was so kind, he took us around for, for two days he spent with us on the entire two days. He took us to, because all other Lumpos were Thai speaking, he was the one who was translating for us everywhere. Uh, he gave us a parting gift of a Buddha Rupa. I said, you should put this in the place wherever you make it. So he gave a proper Buddha statue, and, uh, which I gave to Anish to take up his home. Because, uh, he has a bigger room where he can keep things. So 
that uh, we have got the initial gift of the help of putting up in the mini temple or whatever you want to call it, place where we can meditate and decide. So that was the one very crux of the meetings and uh, the suggestion was that uh, some people suggested, not all, that we should also have a place in the city, Delhi, where we live. So that uh, the, because forest tradition is not very well known in India, and so it would be good if there is a, and the monks who visit India from that tradition, they can come here and spend a few days, meet with people, maybe give a talk, maybe sit and have meditation, guided meditation, so that people come to know about their lifestyle and what exactly they are and what they are uh, have to offer for uh, people in general and for people who have been meditating for a long time. What is exactly the key distinguishing feature from the rest of the traditional things which are popular here in India. That also seemed quite reasonable that we should uh, set up a place like that in Delhi, in the proximity where they can come easily, where people can easily come and that will then form a increase the mass of support which is there needed for the monastery. Because in the beginning, a lot of support will be needed for monastery because some people there, when they go on arms round, they may or may not be able to get food immediately. There should be a backup <coughs> available so that there is some lay person who can prepare food and offer it to them and if need arises that way. And for that purpose also, the, the key thing is that the neighborhood should get involved in the monastery. This is that even in the construction work others, we should involve the neighboring people and neighboring material and so that they feel a sense of ownership of the place. So these were the key uh, suggestions which were made. And of course there were personal I had personal discussions with two of the adults about the various uh, issues concerned with the tradition because you know this Janja tradition also is quite open and some people emphasize on Samadhi aspect, some people like Ajahn Samhita emphasize on wisdom aspect. So that also has to be seen how do we which uh, dimension direction we are going to take. That also I think we'll have to someday decide. And I think we have a meeting of trustees on Japan is still there. Is uh, in Anandgiri where we could not go because we didn't go because it was getting too hectic. So he has gone there and staying for three, four days. He'll come on 11th and then I think thereafter we'll have a trust meeting and decide what exactly should be the direction and what he has to say because he has been meeting them quite a lot. So that also is going to be an issue that we'll see when we sit together and decide what exactly is going to be the emphasis because mixing the two may be difficult. The, from the discussions we had uh, with the people, it seemed to me that it may be better for us to choose a direction. And then we can, of course, it doesn't mean we can't go elsewhere, but monastery should have a one particular flavor. It shouldn't get into kind of complication. That's what it seems. You know, to quickly reflect upon it. We had a we were there in Ratnavan for three days or fifteen days. So we had this. one day we had a question answer session with Ajahn Sumeru. A very powerful session. So I recorded it on my phone and converting it into a video kind of a thing which will be put on the YouTube. So maybe it might be seen. I tried to do it last time but it took a lot of time. Today and put it there. The very direct questions and direct answers. So it's not just one question being answered, a number of questions. So it's quite good. So it was made certain statements which were very revealing. So it was good to listen to that. For all of us, it was very good. The comment of this is one comment when we were talking in the start of the talk, you mentioned that a few of them are Arabs, and the Rakhar's comment is uh, Is the Jan Sumedhu considered an Arab? Yeah, 
his followers consider <laughs> and effectively we i think said forced but the way questions went we made a statement something of that kind toward the end of the question answer session after the life is achieved something because he was feeling happy and satisfied and so made that statement but you know you can't uh, nobody certifies anybody there's general perception among people so perception may be right or wrong <laughs> yeah, because so the next question was to that about this only that like, does he know or acknowledge himself so it looks some of them yes. some out of the at least one of them acknowledges knowledge is in the sense not directly putting a label but in his book which is written by janan book is there and it's some such statements that can be inferred but ajan sir the mostly it is important he in fact he doesn't like to talk about that. everything which is not able to direct experience he just says that i don't know for example with respect to that what happens after death he says that i don't know i have not the idea mm-hmm. so but in this this course of discussion he mentioned this point that that this is the purpose of human life we feel that there's nothing more to be done something of that kind which is a, a statement not all of us can make <laughs> not a ordinary monk cannot make a statement that whatever has to be done has been done you <laughs> need something of that kind i don't remember exactly the words because uh, we overstayed for a long time normally 45 minutes we were staying and he was also going on and then uh, his clock gave a cuckoo sign to <laughs> this is stop <laughs> says the clock is saying stop so, but we had asked a question then he said oh what was the question tell me then said okay we'll just ask this is the last question he asked so in the course of that he made that state because his legs were paining a lot so he opened his legs and terribly sore on this one one foot is both of them are both of them very deep is sore you can't see properly so when i took the this, this laptop small one So he kept it in his lap, and so I might have seen the photograph. So I gave, kept it on the table, but Ajahn Mashoko said you can't see. He gave it him. He gave it in his lap, and so he was very happy. He's on with it, and so it's very pleased that we are doing this. He said toward the end, after the end of the lunch, he said, "I wish I was young." <laughs> <laughs> Would have come. <laughs> we didn't tell him to come. That's that was, yeah, that's not fair. But uh, we did remind Ajahn Ashoko about his promise of February, <laughs> and he said February may be difficult because January they have a very big function. And Ajahn charges hundred per anniversary, and so we are being celebrated on a big scale. And then he said he is planning to go to Portugal. Uh, yeah, so yeah, it's to it's to a new monastery has been set up there. They have been inviting, and we again set up with his initiative and efforts. So his 84th birthday will be celebrated this time in Thailand. He says his 80th birthday was also celebrated in Thailand by the Thai people, and a lot of donations came, and they were sent to the one new monastery for setting up that. And 84th birthday, they say they have that 12 years cycle. Thai people. It's again going to be a big event for them. Therefore, they don't want to go anywhere. And the people make offerings, and they will go to the Portuguese monastery. So then, this birthday again will come in what? July. Oh, July. I don't know July. July is just a thing. So. 
so he will be going to Portugal and he promised that on return he will halt in Delhi. Somewhere in November or October next year, it should be a good weather. He has promised he will stay here for repeat. Either seven day or nine day that we yeah, have to see. So that he has promised. And of course, the answer whether when I said I love India, I will come definitely. Ask him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have seen that Ajahn Asoko mm. is very productive. Yeah. He says he's, he's very caring he, also. Then he mentioned in, his health is in deep trouble. Kidneys, <laughs> everything is failing. But he, of course, continues to be exuberant as usual. <laughs> I think that's where he mentioned that uh, whatever be the state of your body, your mind can still be. And he displays it, you can see. Always peaceful, lovely, happy. I think in one of the uh, suttas also, when a, some uh, elder person goes to Buddha, Buddha says that your faculties are very clear. And I think he follows up with that teaching that I think he also that is very and so, uh, Sile just mentioned that uh, Jan Sumedho's birthday is on 20th, July 27th. So, what we are saying is, uh, uh, we will go to in August or September, we will go to Portugal, stay there for a month or so, and then come to India. So that in Delhi, we have had it. So, he'll, he, I told him that you fix, because we have fixed the program much in advance. So, once they fix up, then so, uh, any other comment? Any friends? I think so. Is and uh, with respect to uh, further work on that site, uh, you're saying that when once fun comes back, then we'll right. possibly. One suggestion was that Jan Amro comes. Let us take it to the site, you know, he's coming in December and let him also see it and then only after that I think we can purchase. Let's wait till that time. Okay. So that he also comes and goes there, sees it personally. And some people had suggested that let him go and see that it's fine. Somebody suggested you ask him for Liam to come, which is about a what perform is supposed to be a album. But he uh, said, uh, we can't really tell him to come and check up our life. It's not, it's not done. And he's quite old. Not as old as Sumedhoji, but quite old. Must be in late 70s or something. And he was quite ill also last year. He was working virtually on deathbed. Sudhakar has this follow up question on if, if Ajahn Savino did not acknowledge himself as a run, how or why the followers came to the conclusion that he is an Aran? Yeah, it's not a conclusion, it's a feeling, perception. There's no conclusion here. There can be no conclusion. You can't. You can't how are we to conclude? Just Even if some, somebody yeah. declares, still. Ajahn Mahabhava was the only person who had openly declared. Ajahn declared. Chah didn't declare. But everybody believes. <laughs> Ajahn Anand also had not openly declared. He's written his experiences of meditation, and from those experiences, people are deriving that conclusion. They're not saying openly that he has. Nobody is saying that. It doesn't matter. What matters is the life he is living. If the teaching gels with him, that's fine. And he often says, you don't have to depend on teacher for uh, your progress. Lose him as a That actually cuts in this talk also, which mentions that. You don't have to expect yeah. the teacher will live up to your expectations and then you will accept. There are examples given by monks to me of other monks who are supposed to be very greatly developed, if not or something, 
and we generally believe to be Vedans. And still, they talk to people very strongly and people can get misled because uh, he's shouting or doing this or doing that. Yeah. There is a story of uh, some uh, somewhere I read the Jancha also that if a person came to me, uh, Jancha, feeling that you know, going to meet a great master, then when you see a Jancha chewing a beta land and uh, putting that in a spittoon, then that whole sight is very different. And then it's your assumption about things that yeah. how a meditation teacher should be. Or Yeah, Ajahn Sumedha actually mentions that. He went and told Ajahn Shah, stop it. <laughs> it doesn't give a good impression. He said, next day, stop. Just stop. It's the continuation of the Sankhara. These are the habit patterns which continue. So, not even Sariputta and Mogulana were not similar. <laughs>